Hello, everyone, and Happy New Year. Welcome to 2022, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. And I was thinking today that it was just about two years ago that we had our, our first seminar, and a lot has happened since then. So uh, today we're starting a new series about abelian varieties and curves over finite fields. And as the first speaker in that series, we are very happy to have Valentine Karamacher speaking on mass formula for super singular uh, uh, curves or abelian varieties for abelian varieties. abelian varieties. Oh yes, and there will be some natural stopping places in the talk where you can ask um, questions and we encourage you to do so. So uh, Valentine, is it all right for us to video this talk? Yes, it is. Okay, please go ahead. Thanks very much, Rachel, for the introduction. And thanks to Rachel and Drew for organizing and for inviting me and to all of you for being here. I'm very excited to kick off this new Vantage series on abelian varieties over finite fields. So um, what about these abelian varieties and why over finite fields? Here are some words uh, that I will properly introduce uh, in a little bit. Our main player is in the middle. Um, we care about abelian varieties for all sorts of reasons, theoretical uh, and for applications to cryptography and coding theory. There are two um, important classes of abelian varieties that you may have seen separately. Uh, the first one is elliptic curves. So these are the one dimensional abelian varieties and also uh, genus one curves. So these are all in here. And the other class is that of Jacobians. Um, which you can construct for any genus G curve and gives you a G dimensional abelian variety. Now this AG over here is the, is the moduli space of G dimensional abelian varieties, which means that points on this AG correspond to isomorphism classes of abelian varieties. Uh, and we've seen all of these objects, uh, they played a big role in the previous Vantage series, for instance, and as we also saw then uh, in a lot of current research. Um, and there they were defined over all sorts of ground fields, but in this series we'll work exclusively uh, with those over finite fields. And they're somewhat special and interesting for a bunch of reasons. And here are some. Um, first of all, over finite fields, we have a very nice explicit description of isogeny classes of these things. I'll also define this notion more uh, later. Second, uh, anything over a finite field, including an abelian variety, is amenable to a computational approach, uh, which you'll also hear a lot more about later in this series. Uh, and thirdly, we have some very useful stratifications of this moduli space in this case, um, that I'll also use in this talk. So the plan for today is, um, well, since it's the first talk in the series, I will spend some time on defining these notions. Um, then uh, I will talk about the moduli space and the stratifications that I mentioned. Uh, and then I'll show two things that we proved about them. So let's get started. Uh, first, by reminding ourselves a little bit about finite fields. Uh, so throughout the talk, FQ will denote the finite field of cardinality Q, which is a power of some prime P. Now there are all sorts of things you can say about finite fields, but here's a list of uh, useful facts. Um, first of all, for every prime p and uh, r greater than or equal to one, there exists a unique finite field fp to the r. And conversely, any field, finite field fq is uh, um, some fp to the r for some p and some r. And second, uh, we understand field extensions of finite fields. We know that fq is contained in fq to the m for any m greater than or equal to one. And thirdly, and that's gonna be most, most important for us, is that all elements of this finite field of Q satisfy that they're equal to their Q's power. So X to the Q is equal to X again. So we'll work over these kinds of fields. Um, and since these elliptic curves were the lowest dimensional abelian varieties, let me start with those. Um, this is a formal definition. An elliptic curve is a genus one, as I said, projective curve, um, so here, here it is. It's given by a um, homogeneous equation. So you can see it's a cubic curve. Here we have a square term, here we have a cube term. And in our case, these coefficients, A, B, C, D, and E, are all going to be defined over the finite field of Q. Elliptic curves also all have a marked point. 
uh, O, the, called the point at infinity, and the points on these elliptic curves from a group, um, which is somehow the most special thing about them. Um, so this is a picture that you may have already seen, but it's always fun, just because it's nice to see that this uh, group law on elliptic curves is something very geometric. Suppose that we want to add the points A and B on this curve, then what do we do? We draw a line through them and we see where that line hits the curve again. It will do so by Bizu. Uh, then we reflect that point over here and this point is then A plus B. Um, this picture is of course not over a finite field, um, but over R. But this is what we have in mind also over finite fields. So that's the definition, but we'll often be interested in uh, the points on such an elliptic curve. So this is um, how we denote that. It's E of FQTM are all the points with projective coordinates x, y, z on the curve, which are defined over FQ to the M. So now we recall um, from the slide about finite fields that over FQ to the M, we have that x to the Q to the M is equal to x again. Um, and that helps us in the following way. If we consider the Frobenius morphism of E, um, denoted phi, what this does to a point uh, x, y, z is that it raises all of the coordinates to the Q to the mth power, as you see here. Then um, by what we said here, we see that the FQ to the m points on E are precisely the points that are held fixed by this Frobenius morphism. So we have a very explicit description, if you want, of these the points on the elliptic curve. Right, now we can also talk about these uh, Frobenius endomorphisms for uh, several hours if we want. They're the key tool to understanding elliptic curves and abelian varieties over finite fields. Um, and one useful thing about them is that we can write down their characteristic polynomials. That's also called the Weyl polynomial. Here I've noted it by P sub phi. Um, this is a polynomial with integer coefficients. Uh, it's of degree two when we're working with elliptic curves. And over Q bar, its roots are alpha and alpha bar, the complex conjugate. And these are then called the vial numbers of the elliptic curve. Some very deep and exciting results about these things. Uh, so I've listed them briefly here. First of all, the Riemann hypothesis, which is proven in this case, says that the uh, absolute value of this alpha is equal to square root of Q, where Q is the cardinality of the finite field. And second, the vial conjectures also proven, um, give us an expression of the cardinality of the set of FQ to the M points in terms of, of the powers of, this, of these vial numbers here. So this is true for any M greater than equal to one. And thirdly, um, by results of Honda and Tate, uh, alpha and its conjugate uh, determine E up to isogeny. Now, what does this mean? I want to say just a few words about this. Um, an isogeny of elliptic curves, say psi, from E1 to E2, it's a surjective map with finite kernel. So you should think of this as like an almost isomorphism. Uh, it turns out that isogenies give you an equivalence relation. So if there's an isogeny from E1 to E2, there's also one from E2 to E1. Um, and the other properties hold too. So we write E1 isogenous to E2. And we can consider the equivalence classes of this relation, which are then called the isogeny classes. So this is what appeared on the very first slide. Uh, and we'll hear a lot more about isogeny classes in this vintage series. So keep an eye out. Um, all right. So when we bundle all of this information together, we can also write down the zeta function of an elliptic curve. Uh, which is the following thing. So by definition, it's the, the exponential of this generating series where here we have the FQ to the M points on E um, when we sum over M. And uh, miraculously, this turns out to be a rational function um, where the numerator clearly depends on these uh, vial numbers. It's actually a scaled version of the, of the vial polynomial. And the numerator here 
uh, is the zeta function of the projective line. Right. Then I um, wanted to say just a few things about p-torsion on elliptic curves. Uh, so what do I mean with this? Well, the p-torsion points uh, on an elliptic curve over q, they are the points on the elliptic curve defined over the bar, such that if you add them to themselves p times in this geometric way that we saw, then you get the point at infinity, which plays the role of the zero element in the group. You know, since elliptic curve is fairly small, there are only two possibilities really for this p torsion. Uh, we could have that uh, the p torsion is isomorphic to z mod pz. And in this case, we say that the elliptic curve is ordinary, or we could have that it's uh, trivial, in which case we say that a is, e is super singular. So every elliptic curve is either ordinary or super singular. And the, the cool thing is that we can read this off from this wild polynomial that I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, and I should also say that ordinary is really the generic case. You would expect a random, randomly sampled elliptic curve to be, to be ordinary. Well, now that I've got all of these words out of the way, um, we can just scale this up and define all of this for uh, abelian varieties in any dimension. So that's what we do now. Um, the formal definition is here. So an abelian variety is a non-singular projective group variety. And here, again, the key word uh, is group. So these are algebraic groups. Um, we can write down the zeta function of any abelian variety over fq of dimension g. Um, it's defined in the same way. So it's this exponential of the generating series of the points over extensions. Um, again, this is a rational function, but now slightly more complicated because for elliptic curves, we only have this p1, but now we have uh, 2g of these things. And these really correspond to the Frobenius acting on cohomology at different weights. Um, but the important thing is that it's still determined by the wild polynomial, which is, again, the characteristic polynomial of the Frobenius endomorphism. Uh, this is now degree 2g polynomial with integer coefficients and its roots, uh, alpha i, are the vial numbers of the, of the abelian variety. So here are the same three facts again um, for abelian varieties in general. We know something about the absolute value of the alpha i, they're all square root q. They come in complex conjugate pairs. We can express the number of points over q to the m uh, in terms of uh, powers, uh, combinations of powers of the vial numbers. And again, uh, the same results of Honda and Tate show that these Alpha i, the set of them up to conjugacy, determines the abelian variety up to isogeny. So then similarly, when I put this on the same slide, uh, we can also define what it means for an abelian variety to be ordinary or super singular. Um, it's ordinary if the number of p-torsion points is as large as it can be. And it's super singular if it's as small as it can be. And this is equivalent to x being isogenous, so there being an isogeny between x and e to the g, uh, where e is a super singular elliptic curve. And we can again read off from the wild polynomial what happens, but I should note that in dimension greater than two, there are also other options. So you can be uh, ordinary or super singular or some, something in between, but more about that later. Um, and then a little bit about these Jacobians that I mentioned um, at the beginning. These you can define for uh, any smooth projective connected curve over FQ of G minus G. Um, I'm not going to give you the technical definition. The main thing is what I said before that it, you can associate a G dimensional abelian variety with it, which is the Jacobian. And then if you look at the zeta function of the curve, so the, uh, where you look at the generating series for the, the points on the curve over extensions, uh, then this is again a rational function of this form. There's again one numerator polynomial, which is a weighted version of the wild polynomial of the Jacobian. So if we have the Frobenius acting on the Jacobian, then the characteristic polynomial of that is the wild polynomial. And it's again this t degree 2g polynomial with integer coefficients with wild numbers as roots. So we have this nice interplay between 
one dimensional curves on the one hand and these g-dimensional varieties on the other hand. Okay, this is a very short crash course in uh, abelian varieties over finite fields. Are there any questions before I move on to the moduli spaces? All right. Sounds um, great. Thanks, I'll move on. Um, here's this AG again that we saw before. Now when working with moduli spaces, it's often useful to go to an algebraically closed field. Um, so I'll now let K be such a field. Um, you can think of this as FP bar or FQ bar, it's the same thing. Um, and AG then um, properly defined as the moduli space over K of principally polarized G-dimensional abelian varieties. Now, I haven't said much about this principal polarization um, business, but it basically means that there exists an isomorphism between the abelian variety and its dual. And I'm sure you'll hear more about these polarizations also later in the series of talks. Um, we know that this moduli space is irreducible. We know its dimension, g g plus one over two. And as I said, there are many uh, different structures we can put on it. So one comes from considering p divisible groups. So for any um, abelian variety in the moduli space, uh, I'm suppressing the information of the polarization often, if it doesn't lead to confusion. Then its p divisible group is here. This is some kind of system uh, that is a limit of the p torsion, p to the n torsion as n goes to infinity. And you can consider these also up to isogeny, which again is a surjective map with a finite kernel. So if you look at the isogeny class of the p divisible group, then this determines a Newton polygon. I'm not going to give a formal definition of these, um, but the main takeaway is that this gives a stratification, the Newton stratification, where all elements, uh, where a stratum consists of all abelian varieties with the same Newton polygon. Um, the same uh, data of the isogeny class of the p divisible group that also determines what's called the p rank of the abelian variety. Um, so here's a quick definition. If you look at the cardinality of the p torsion on x, then this is a p to the f for some f, and this f is a p rank. So a Newton polygon is a set of slopes, and the p rank is the number of zero slopes. So that's how this determination goes very quickly. Um, and this leads to another stratification called the p-rank stratification, where a stratum consists of all abelian varieties with the same p-rank. Well, that's for AG, very quickly, um, but ever since I started studying the super singular abelian varieties uh, together with Rachel Priest, I've been more interested in them. Um, so let's look at the moduli space of those things too. So here's a quick recap that a variety is super singular, that means that it's isogenous to a power of a super singular elliptic curve. And SG will be the moduli space of these things, so of principally polarized g dimensional super singular abelian varieties. Um, super singular abelian varieties have a unique p divisible group, uh, or in other words, all super singular abelian varieties have the same Newton polygon. And that means that you can view this SG, this moduli space, as a Newton stratum, as one of the Newton strata in AG. Um, we then know that they all must have the same P rank too, and this P rank is actually zero because the slopes are all one half. The converse, P rank zero implying super singular, is only true in dimension one or two. Otherwise, there are other options of having P rank zero but not be super singular. Um, and we know a lot about the space SG as well. Uh, we know that every component has dimension the floor of G squared over four. Uh, we also know the number of components. We can express those as class numbers. Um, and uh, we know a lot about the other structure of this space. So we'll be most interested in SG. But to give you some further structure on these things, there's also another stratification for which I need to introduce yet another notion, and that's the A number. So 
So uh, this you can define this for any x in AG. The A number is defined as follows. A number of x is the dimension of this space of the maps from alpha p into x, where alpha p is the, the kernel of Frobenius acting on the additive group. It's some kind of finite group scheme. Um, the A number depends on the isomorphism class of the P torsion. So before we saw things depending on the isogeny class of the whole P divisible group, and now it's the isomorphism class of the P torsion. Um, this gives another uh, stratification like so. For each x with p rank f, we know that the a number is between 0 and g minus f. And so for x in sg, uh, where f equals 0, we can actually show that it's between 1 and g. And the a number stratification we, we denote like this. Uh, so sg is a disjoint union of the uh, sga, where this sga is the stratum of all supersingular abelian varieties with a number a. So some quick facts about these. Um, again, we know the dimension of each component, and we know how many components there are. Again, uh, this is work of Harishita. It can also be expressed in terms of class numbers. Um, and one special case that I'd like to mention is that of A number G. So that's the maximal A number. And this is equivalent to X being super special. And that is that it's not just isogenous, but isomorphic to a power of E, so e to the g. And this super special stratum, uh, SGG, is zero dimensional. So just a bunch of points in the moduli space. Um, this fact, by the way, is due to Oort. So that is our third stratification. There's also a fourth one, and that will be the last one, I promise. Uh, it's the Ekada Oort stratification. And this, again, depends on the isomorphism class of the P torsion. Um, there's a way of uh, characterizing this isomorphism class by an element of the vial group of the symplectic group, or equivalently by something called an elementary sequence. So I'm not going to define these, but I'm happy to talk about them more later. The point is that for each uh, such a sequence you can write down, you get a stratum called S sub phi, and AG is then a disjoint union of these strata as well, that again depend on the isomorphism class of the P torsion. We know the dimension of these strata. We know how to uh, determine how to go between elements of the vowel group and elementary sequences and back. Um, but that's another story. For us, it's important to note that the Akira Oort stratification refines the P rank stratification. Uh, and that, um, so that means that each P rank stratum fall, breaks into different Akira Oort strata. Um, and we can then consider the echidal oort stratification on SG as well, simply by intersecting each echidal oort stratum with SG and looking at the disjoint union of those. Now, some of these S phi might be fully contained in the supersingular um, locus SG. And there's a nice combinatorial criterion that decides when that happens. Um, but in general, we don't really know the intersections of echidal oort strata with SG. So we don't know in all cases what this intersection looks like. Um, we do know that those fully contained in SG are reducible, while all other strata are irreducible, like of several people. And uh, we know that the A number is constant on Ekara or strata 2, so it refines the A number stratification as well. Uh, in other words, we can write each A number stratum as a disjoint union of these S phi intersected with SG. Uh, again, in general, it's still open how other Newton strata, so not just SG, how those intersect with uh, echidna or strata, and how Newton strata intersect with general A number strata, there's a lot that's still to be investigated there. But those were basically the four stratifications I wanted to tell you about. So the um, two depending on the iso isogeny class of the p-divisible group, and these two on the isomorphism class of the p-torsion. Um, but what if we want to go further and discuss p divisible groups, but up to isomorphism? Um, then we need to look at things called uh, central leaves. So here's a, a definition of those. 
if you look at a point in the moitralized space, x corresponding to an x0 with a polarization, then um, the central leaf lambda x consists of all other supersingular abelian varieties with the same, with isomorphic uh, p divisible group. Um, so I'll talk more about these later. Uh, every, each of the infinitely many different lambda x is finite, but determining the exact size is a very difficult problem in general. Um, we can use a useful description that I've written down here in terms of automorphism group schemes. So if G of X uh, over Z is the automorphism group scheme, which means that over any ring R, the, the R points on it are all the uh, automorphisms here that, um, well, this condition means that they're compatible or stable under the Rosati involution, then uh, there's a way to give a bijection between lambda X, the central leaf, and this following double coset. So here we have the finite adelic points on, the, on GX, here the Z hat points and the, the Q points. Um, right, so then one can hope uh, that we can look at this mass and give an even finer stratification of the marginalized space. Here's a quick reminder of the definition of the central leaf. And one of our goals has been to, for any X uh, in SG, compute its mass, which means the mass of its central leaf. And that is defined as the sum of one over the uh, cardinality of the automorphism group running over all the elements of the central leaf. So if we find a nice expression for this mass, then that's what we call a mass formula, a nice formula that um, computes this mass for you. And as a quick aside, in case you're more comfortable with those notions, the mass can also be seen as a volume uh, of this coset here. Uh, and it's also an arithmetic mass in this sense where GX of Z hat is an open compact subgroup. Um, are there any questions about the stratification, moduli space stratification part? I saw some activity in the chat. Is there anything I should see? I think the questions were answered. I posted a few references for those who, who want to see the origin. Oh, the amazing, Lord thank you so much. And Honda Tate. Great. Okay, um, then I'll go on with the two things that I, I worked on. The first one is uh, where we looked at S3. So we chose G equals three and we worked out mass formulae for all of the points in S3. And the second is what we called the Gauss problem of determining when the central leaves have cardinality exactly one. So let's, uh, oops, I missed this one out. Yeah, we're hoping for a mass stratification, which should refine the other stratifications. Um, right, so the story for S3 begins with finding a useful description of S3 as a modular space. Um, so that's what we start doing here. Um, we, we choose g equals three. We choose a specific elliptic curve, super singular over fp squared, whose Frobenius is minus p, and this always exists. So that's a safe choice. And we choose any principal polarization of E cubed. Then we can define a polarized flag type quotient, uh, PFTQ for short, with respect to this mu. Um, and this is a chain of isogenies that looks like this. So, um, we start here with y2, which is uh, e cubed. So this is actually super special, you know, isomorphic to e cubed. Uh, and then it goes to y1 and to y0. And often I'll leave out the polarizations uh, to make it easier to read. And these isogenies row one and row two that appear here, they uh, satisfy some technical conditions on what their uh, kernels should be. But I won't go much into that. You can define these PFTQs in any dimension. I've just written down the three-dimensional one because we're going to be using them. Um, and we can look at a moduli space of these uh, PFTQs. That's called P sub mu. Uh, Lee and Ort prove that this is, a, in the case of S3, this is a two-dimensional geometrically irreducible scheme over Fp squared. 
Now, what's the, uh, the exact relation between P mu and S3? Uh, that's what we'll explain now. Here's a quick re recap of the definition of a PFTQ. And it follows from the definitions, if you check that the, the last one, Y0, is actually principally polarized. So that's in S3. So in other words, there's a projection map from P mu to S3 um, where you just truncate. You send the whole PFTQ to its last entry, Y0. Um, and this map is such that when you loop over all mu's, this gives you a surjective and generically finite map. So the way to think about this is that each P mu approximates a geometrically irreducible component of S3. And you get them all if you run over all of the all, all mu's. <laughs> Um, now we introduce uh, the a Fermat curve. You might be wondering why, but it will become clear in a second. So the Fermat curve C with this given equation here, so in P2, uh, we know a lot about this curve. We, we understand the rational points, the number of rational points over P and overall extensions. We know what its genus is, P, P minus one over two. We know that there's a left action on these things by a unitary group, P3. And the reason that we uh, consider it here is that there is a way, a structure morphism pi from P mu down to C, which makes it into a P1 bundle, a vector bundle of rank two. Um, this structure morphism just corresponds to a forgetful map um, where you leave out the Y zero, since C you can view as a classifying space of isogenies of a certain type. Anyway, there is this pi down to C, uh, and there's also a section to this map, which goes from C to, well, I've called the image T that lives in, in P mu. Why am I saying all these things? Um, because it gives us a very useful handle on uh, S3. Namely, for each point in it, for each x lambda, uh, we know there exists a polarization mu of e, e cubed and a PFTQ y, so a sequence above it, uh, or that projects down to this x lambda. So the final term is the x that we start with. And now this PFTQ is uniquely characterized by two parameters. Uh, we have T, which is a point on our Fermat curve, and we have U, which is a point on the, uh, the fiber of the um, morphism pi above it. So this is in the image of T under pi, and it's some point on a P1. And these T and U's are going to affect what the mass is of the point that we're looking at. All right, so now that we see um, that we are going to be using P mu, let's study its structure some more. For this, we use the A number again. Recall that for uh, an abelian variety X, we said the A number is this dimension over here. Now, if we have a PFTQ, so a sequence of isogenies, then we say that its A number is the A number of the last term, so of Y zero. Um, then here are some facts. These are all due to the N ort. The first one is, well, um, as we saw before, the A number for a simple singular threefold is either one, two, or three. And we know that it's three if and only if X is super special. Um, second, if Y is in T, so in this section, the image of the section, then the corresponding um, PFTQ has A number three. So it corresponds to something super special. Uh, if the parameter t is defined over fp squared, so it's an fp squared point on the Fermat curve, then um, this gives a PFTQ with a number at least two, so two or three, and vice versa. And if neither of those two things happen, then the a number is one. So the a number is one is equivalent to uh, y not being in the section and um, the parameter t not being an fp squared point on c. So basically, the a number tells us uh, where we are on p mu, and it gives us restrictions on what the parameters t and u can be. Uh, so here's a little picture um, of the situation. This, this thing up here is p mu, uh, and this is the map pi here down to c. So the Fermat curve, the section T, so that's the map back from C into P mu, uh, points on that have A number three. 
And if we look at the fp squared points on C, these are somewhere here, and at the, the fibers above them, then on those blue lines, the A number is two or three. And everywhere else, we know that um, the A number is one. So in all the white areas. So you can see that this is really the generic case. Uh, we have A number one most of the time. Okay, now you might have gotten a little lost, like why am I talking about all of these things? Um, so time to connect back to our problem of determining masses. And that goes through something called the minimal isogeny. Um, so what is the minimal isogeny? If we start with a super singular abelian variety X, then the minimal isogeny is a map, again, phi, sorry, I'm using phi too many times. I hope it's not confusing. Um, it's a map from a super special abelian variety, so isomorphic to E to the G, to X. You can also define minimal isogenies um, from super singular varieties, but we won't use those. And minimal really means that any other isogeny from something super special factors through this given phi. And the idea is that we can construct minimal isogenies from the PFT cues. So if you're interested in the minimal isogeny for X, then you take that to be your Y zero and a PFT queue above it. Um, and you study that because we saw that the, the starting term is Y2, uh, is super special. Um, yeah, we need to separate a few cases, again, based on the A number. Well, if the A number is three, then X is itself super special. And so the minimal isogeny would just be the identity. So there's nothing to do there. If the A number is two, um, then we can show that this middle term here already has A number three. So that's super special. And therefore the minimal isogeny is just this part of the PFTQ. And if the A number is one, um, then we really need the full PFTQ to give us the minimal isogeny. So the map, the composition from Y2 down to X, that gives um, the minimal isogeny in this case. I see some activity in the chat, but I hope you uh, will <laughs> let me know if there's something I should look at. So um, if not, let me explain why these minimal isogenies are helpful. And really the idea is that um, through the minimal isogeny, you can compare the automorphism groups as living inside the same one. So in other words, if you have a minimal isogeny phi from y to x, uh, and you write this point, little x is corresponding to x and x tilde as that corresponding to y. Then we had this automorphism group scheme gx that I um, wrote down also in the description of lambda x. And through phi, we can view both of these open compact subgroups as lying inside the same group that uh, depends on x tilde on the super special one. So what do I mean really is that we can compare the mass of x or of lambda x to that of lambda tilde x, x tilde. So here we have the mass of lambda x, we have that of lambda x tilde. Uh, and here's the comparison factor um, where we can now really make sense of these intersections. And really what this comes down to is the index of the automorphism group of the p-divisible group of x in that of y. So slogan to remember is that through PFTQs, we constructed minimal isogenies and through minimal isogenies, we can compare any super singular mass to a super special mass. But of course, that wouldn't be useful unless we knew the super special masses. But fortunately, those are actually known. Um, they're known in any dimension by work of many people. I've written some names on this slide. Um, and in dimension three, the result looks like this. So consider a super special abelian threefold. Um, then it can either be principally polarized or it can have a polarization whose kernel is isomorphic to two copies of this alpha p group scheme. And in both cases, uh, the mass has been computed. So this is the principal polarized case, principally polarized case, case, and this is the other case. Um, so this is totally explicit. Uh, and now the work that we had to do was basically to compute these indices of automorphism groups um, to get the right comparison factors and conclude the masses for all super singular abelian varieties. And again, we do this by A number, where for A number three, there's nothing to be done because the, the answer is right here. Um, 
that's because I should maybe mention that if X is super special, then lambda X really is the set of all isomorphism classes with that kernel of polarization. So there's a unique P divisible group in that case. Anyway, so we, we uh, then still have to do the cases of A number two and A number one. Um, so let's start with A number two, since it's slightly less complicated. And so here's the setup. We start with X uh, in S3, which has A number two. Then we saw uh, previously that it's the PFTQ above it is characterized by a pair T and U, where T now has to be an FP squared point. This is one of the blue lines that we're now on. Um, and U is a point on P1 that does not live over FP2, FP squared. And that's because otherwise the A number would be three. So we would also be on the red line and we don't want that. Um, then we also noted that the minimal exogeny was just this first part, y1 to x. And so the index we need to compute is set for um, the p divisible group of x in that of y1. So I'm just going to give a sketch of the ideas um, that we, yeah, how we proved it. Um, and that's by using reduction maps. So we have a reduction map from this automorphism group for y1 uh, to SL2 over fp squared, which is really a reduction modulo, um, the dual of the Jordan A module, but I'm not going to uh, describe this more in more detail. It comes down to reducing to fp squared. And the automorphism group of x is then um, reduced to the intersection of SL2 with this end u times. And u times is really the um, reduction of the endomorphism ring of X. And we know what it looks like, the reduction, um, is one of two things, depending on the field of definition of U. So if U is defined over FP to the four, then it's FP to the four, isomorphic two. And if that's not the case, so then there was some other field of definition, then it's FP squared. And so since end of U is so explicit, uh, the, we can also explicitly compute this intersection, and there are two um, options for that. What that can be, again, depending on you. So we have reduction maps, but also we uh, prove that this reduction is subjective. Um, so that really, when you want to compute the index of the automorphism groups, it suffices to look at the index of the reduced uh, groups, so of the intersection of SL2 with NU times in SL2 FP squared. Um, and the cardinality of that, again, there are two options for it, depending on whether U is defined over FP to the four or not. And then we are done um, because we knew the super special mass, we now have the comparison factor. So the, the theorem tells us that there are two mass strata in the A number two uh, stratum of S3. Um, I've put them here. I hope you can still read the bottom of the slide. Um, let me add here that this quantity EP that you see up here over here, that's uh, nothing to be afraid of. It's zero if P is two and one otherwise. And so we have a nice explicit mass formula like we were after. Um, one thing to note is that the super special mass that we need in this case is not the principally polarized one. You can show that in this case, Y1 is not principally polarized. So we need the second bullet point of that slide. All right, let me say just um, a few words about the A number one case, since this is more complicated. Um, the setup is as we have seen. So we start with an X that has A number one. Then we know that the PFTQ above that is characterized by T, which does not live over FP squared. So it lives away from that. Uh, and U can a priori be anything. And we've also seen that the minimal isogeny in this case is the full, comes from the full uh, PFTQ. So we need to compute the index for X, the p-divisible group of that, in that of Y2, the one all the way at the top. And because of this two-step procedure and there being many more cases to distinguish, uh, this was really the bulk of the work for us to, uh, to compute this index. And I'm just going to show you what we found at the end. Um, 
it looks like this. So there are now three mass strata in the O number one um, stratum of S3. And they are determined again by where U and T live. Um, but now it's not so much about the field of definition of U as whether it lives on this DT or not. So DT is a fiber of a certain divisor uh, in the trivialization of P mu. Um, we have an explicit description of the, of the divisor and it cuts out the space where the mass uh, has a certain value. So if we look here, uh, EP is the same as on the previous slide. So it's either zero or one. And this uh, DT over here, that um, is a more interesting quantity. It's something between three and six. Uh, and it's in a very uh, explicit way related to the degree of T over FP squared. So the field of definition of, of T, if you want. Um, and this really gave us the, the mass formulae that we were after. But the story didn't quite end there because we, we were wondering if we could apply these computations also to other questions. And indeed we could, so I wanted to uh, say a little bit about that too. We applied this to studying Oort's conjecture. What did Oort's conjecture say? It states that every generic g-dimensional principally polarized super singular abelian variety uh, has automorphism group C2, so just plus minus one, which is as small as it can be. Um, you might expect this conjecture to be true because it holds for ordinary abelian varieties. There we know uh, that, it's, that it holds. But in fact, we already knew that it didn't hold in general um, because Ort himself constructed a counterexample and also Ibikiyama. This one is due to Ibikiyama and this one to Ort. Uh, so they found uh, counterexamples notably when P is equal to two. And using um, our mass formulae, we could prove the following statement, which is that in dimension three, Oort's conjecture holds precisely when P is not equal to two. So a few remarks about this. Um, generic, uh, the statement, the word that we saw in the statement of the conjecture, uh, that means first that the A number is one, as we saw, this is what happens most of the time. Uh, and the PFTQ corresponding to this X then uh, has parameters T and U where T is not defined over FP squared, it's away from FP squared, and where U is not in this special divisor uh, D depending on T. Um, so then we know which case of our mass formula to apply. Uh, and further computations in this case then show that the uh, automorphism group is one of two things. When P is not equal to two, it's T2. So this um, is what Ord predicted. And when P equals two, then it's C2 cubed. So definitely not C2. That's um, all I wanted to say about these mass formulae for S3. Are there any questions about this? Yeah, quick question. Is is uh, an analog of this known for g equals two? Um, yes, that's due to Ibukiyama, if I um, remember correctly. Well, Valentine, you could also mention like there was we proved something for g equals two and p is odd, proving Oort's conjecture. That's true. Uh, we proved a, a limit statement um, about the the general behavior as uh the yes but i let me put that maybe in the chat later a reference to our proposition that's true yes that gave further evidence for the for the conjecture also any more questions then in the final bit uh which will not be very long i'm afraid is I wanted to mention this Gauss problem that I said a few words about. Um, for this, let me recall the definition of a central leaf. That was for any X, um, the set of all varieties with isomorphic P divisible group to that of X. And that this Gauss problem that we asked ourselves is to determine precisely for which X in SG 
um, we have that the cardinality of the central leaf is exactly one. And we call this a Gauss problem because um, there's also a Gauss problem for class numbers of uh, permission lattices, and it's very much related to that. Um, maybe those who know more about this theory can already imagine why this relation exists. Um, one, one quick word before I go into what we did. Uh, I defined the central leaf for any point in SG, but you could define it for any point in AG. There's no problem with that. Um, though Ching Li Chai proved that the cardinality of the central leaf is finite if and only if x, the point x you're considering is super singular, so it's in SG. In other words, if we want to look at the Gauss problem, uh, it definitely suffices to look at SG only. So this is our uh, main result in progress, hopefully coming out soon. I work with Ibukiyama and Chapuyu. And it says the following, I take any x in SG, then uh, this cardinality of the central leaf is one if and only if one of the following three cases holds. So either g equals one and p is lies in a very explicit finite list of primes, or g equals two and p is two or three, or g equals three, p equals two, and the a number of x is at least two. Um, and so for larger g, it never happens <laughs> that this cardinality is one. The result for g equals one was already known, uh, and it follows from work of Marie-France Vignerat on class numbers of quaternion algebras. So we didn't have to prove anything there, because in this case, lambda x uh, for any x is the whole super singular locus. So you're really counting uh, how many of those p divisible groups there are, or how many of those um, elliptic curves there are, sorry. Second remark is that the result for G equals two was recently proven by Ibukiyama as well by studying quaternion and Hermitian groups. Uh, so again, we knew that case two provided uh, situations where the central leaf has cardinality one. And so we really only need to look at G equals three and higher. Um, well, for, we can deal with all cases of G being um, five or greater in one fell swoop by the following kind of argument. Here we look at uh, lambda g p to the c, which is a set of isomorphism classes of um, g-dimensional, principally polarized, principally fell off, super special, oh, sorry, it's not principal. <laughs> sorry, of g-dimensional polarized super special abelian varieties with a polarization that has a kernel isomorphic to alpha p to the 2c. Okay, why do we look at this set? Um, for a number of reasons. Um, like in the super special case, if you pick a point x in this lambda, then lambda of x is the whole of lambda g p, p to the c. So there's a unique bit of visible group in this lambda. And second, if you look at any point in SG, um, then there always exists a surjection from its central leaf to some appropriate lambda g p to the c for some value of c between zero and the floor of g over two. Uh, and thirdly, like the super special masses um, I mentioned at the beginning, these, the masses of these lambda g p to the c are all known for any g and any c um, by work of Hashimoto and others. So this is already enough, these three facts, to prove uh, the statement for g greater than equal to five, because using the third fact that we know these super special um, the masses of lambda g p to the c, we can prove um, that the cardinality of lambda is always greater than one. And now if we look at part two, we, we see that any lambda x surjects onto something that is already uh, of cardinality greater than one. So of course, lambda x itself will also have cardinality greater than one. Um, so that, that's it really for, for greater than five, greater than equal to five. And the tricky cases were those of g equals three and g equals four. Um, so yeah, that's where most of the work lies. And I'm just going to say a few words since I'm out of time about how you would go about such a thing. Well, when g equals three, we use the mass formula that I just told you about. Um, the mass formula in combination with computations of automorphism groups, of course, because the mass was this summing over the sizes of the automorphism groups over the lambda x. So just knowing the mass would give you like a finite number of options 
for the cardinality of lambda, but you can't always pinpoint which one it is unless you really know enough about the automorphism groups. Um, unless you can show that the mass has a numerator, which is not one, in which case <laughs> the mass is also always, or the cardinality is also always greater than that. So anyway, for g equals three, uh, our previous work um, with some extra computations gave the result. And genus four, uh, dimension four, sorry, uh, proved to be the most interesting and most difficult case. So what we did is roughly the following. Um, we know that in this case, when g equals four, the surjection uh, from lambda x to some lambda g p to the c is induced from the minimal exogeny. This is not true for any uh, or every g, but it is true for g equals four. Uh, and this knowledge and uh, knowing about these minimal isogenies um, allowed us to compare the mass of lambda x with the appropriate mass of this lambda and also the cardinality of lambda x with that of lambda f for p to the c for the right value of c. Uh, and then we conclude basically by working one echoed outward stratum at a time. So we worked out uh, in dimension four um, what the super singular locus looks like, which echo or strata intersect it, and how, um, and we treat them each individually. And that was uh, enough to yield the results. More details to be announced soon when we uh, have finished writing up. So that's all I wanted to say for today. Um, thank you very much for listening, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer any more questions if they are. Oh, thanks. That was wonderful. Uh, so uh, does anyone want to follow up on a question in the chat or, or ask a different question? Edgar, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, I was wondering about the parse conjecture. Mm -hmm. you, you said there are cotton examples, but it seems like all the cotton examples are for p equals two. So okay. I wonder, is that the issue of p being, being if, I was wondering if there's any cotton example where p is odd. And not that we know, or not that I know that we know. <laughs> okay. um, so that's also the guess in other dimensions that p equals two is the is where things where different things happen. Okay. Um, we are working on the on the word conjecture for dimension four. Cool. cool. Thank you. Thanks. Let's see, Andrew. Are you in a place you could? Oh, no sound. So I'll read Andrew's question for him. Um, so can this mass formula be interpreted as a point count of an algebraic stack? That's the question. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, I think this is exactly what you do when you study stacks, but, um, although I don't do that myself. Um, so right, then what you do is you weight everything by the size of the appropriate automorphisms and you count those. So that's something that people who study moduli spaces of curves also do a lot. I think they're interested in these weighted counts. Um, I'm not sure if we have told them anything new um, by providing these mass formulae in dimension three, um, but that is one definitely one way of uh, viewing this formula. Yes, thank you. There's a follow up. Oh, uh, and then Andrew's wondering what the stack would be. What the stack would be? Um, I wouldn't want to have a guess when I'm being recorded. <laughs> um, we can talk more about this later. So you talked about the mass strata for, for SG. Does this tell you anything about kind of mass strata kind of further out on AG or does it not make sense there? Or? Probably does. And uh, that's another thing we're currently thinking about. So I can't, uh, I can't tell you at this moment that we are trying to see if we can set it up uh, or at least make sense of it for A3 to get to start with. Yeah. Yeah, we're hoping to say something in general in progress. <laughs> Thanks. So you talked about various sub varieties of, of SG and AG. Um, do these have any relevance to the module, to the Mori theory of, of SG and AG? Like do they are there um, extreme arrays supported on them? I'm sorry, I don't, don't think I heard everything. 
What would, could you repeat the start of your question? Yeah, sir. Um, I was just wondering, um, sub-varieties of SG and AG that you've described, um, do they have some relevance to the Mori theory of SG and AG? Or are there, for example, extremal rays um, given by curves that are supported on them? Oh, um, that is a very good question. I don't know very much about that. I expect uh, you can say a lot about these things. I think Rachel might know a lot more than me um, about this. I'm not too sure, to be honest. Yeah, I, I would need more context to think about that, Adam. I'm not sure. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. Oh, wonderful. Uh, so uh, thanks again. Let's all thank Valentine for this great talk. <laughs> thanks for coming. <laughs> And our, our next talk will be in two weeks on February 1st by Stefano Marseglia. Wonderful. Happy New Year, everyone. I hope you have a, a great, a great January. <laughs>